Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. In this particular interview we explore the conservation efforts of anglers, and of Scottish anglers in particular, through the group known as the Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network, also known as the SACAN for short. When Scottish anglers first approached the Scottish Assembly with their concerns, particularly for sharks and rays, asking for a better deal for these and other fish instead of the one in place at the time which was heavily biased towards commercial fishing interests, they were asked to back up their arguments with scientific data, which at that time they simply did not have. And so, the concept of the organised mass tagathon was born. That said, tagging is not a new concept in Scottish waters. Common skate have been tagged there for many years, as have taught by the now Sasakan project director Ian Burrett aboard his Dromore based boat on your marks. What made this project different was that it was targeted, had a focused objective and would enlist the input of visiting anglers aboard their own boats to help with all the field work required. The first mass tagging event was aimed at gathering data from spur dogs and was fished across the two venues of Loch Etive and Loch Sunnar. I was present at that inaugural event and I have to say that the level of support from small boat anglers, kayakers, even some charter enthusiasts and shore anglers from both sides of the border to get involved, I think took everybody a little bit by surprise. So much so that not only was this event repeated in subsequent years, but extra events at Loose Bay and Crinham were also added, targeting ever more species in an attempt to understand more fully the extent or otherwise of the diversity, distribution and density of populations of all shark and ray species in Scottish coastal waters. For statistics buffs, at the time of the October 2011 mass tagging event on Loch Summer, which is where I am today, Recaptures of fish in previous events are running at 21, often from the same marks they were originally taken from and spread right across the year, suggesting that these are indeed resident populations as the Sakan has been saying for so long. Taking Scotland as a whole now, 654 tagged spur dog recaptures have been made, mainly from fish tagged elsewhere outside of the event. In addition to this, 2,917 common skate tagged have resulted in 973 recaptures and of the 1,911 top that have received tags, a total of 93 have been recaught. And let me also add that as a result of the various Sasakan projects, which are still ongoing, as of January 1st 2012, top, spur dogs, common skate and poor beagle sharks, plus a few other deep water species, will all become protected in Scottish waters as they are already in England and Wales. Now as you can probably no doubt tell from the wave slap and boat noise, I'm actually out fishing aboard a Warrior 165 at the moment out from Salem on Loch Sunnet with the boat's owners and tagging event organisers Willie Kennedy and Stuart Creswell. Perhaps if you both introduce yourselves it might aid voice recognition as we go along. Hi, I'm Willie Kennedy. Within the Sasakin, I suppose Stuart and myself run the events really, which is the three tagging events that we run annually. Hi, I'm uh, Stuart Creswell. Um, I'm part of the Scottish Sea Anglers Conservation Network's events team. This particular event, the Tagathon, conceived and fished for the first time in 2008, was the forerunner of the current three venue project. But unlike the other two, targeting Torp in Loose Bay and Common Skate at Crennan, plus any other cartilaginous species that might happen to come along, as I've already said, the fishing gear is spread across the two separated venues of Loch Summit and Loch Etive, with dinghy, kayak, charter boat and shore anglers all taking part. So could you explain to me some of the logistics here, plus the framework instructions to ensure that best use is made of all shark and ray species coming up? Obviously it is a multi-centre event, Phil. The reason we do that is simply because of the nature of it. We want people to fish in lots of different areas, from the point of view of uh, on boats, as you say, on kayaks, off the beach, and obviously to try and catch as many different spur dogs, thornback rays and common skate from all these different areas. The information we give them is a participants pack which tells them all about fish care and handling, how to tag the fish and how to put them safely back in the water. Various people and organisations, both here in the UK and beyond, have been sticking simple dart tags into various species of fish for as far back as I can remember. What is it then that makes the dart tag into this particular event, or should I say ongoing package of events, different to what has gone before? Sasakin was formed really because 
a number of anglers uh, felt that the fishing was declining to such a level that we had to do something. I think the initial sort of get together was more involved. There was uh, articles in the fishing news for the commercial guys about commercially targeting taupe and there was some particular uh, fish selling company were looking for uh, boats, commercials like throughout the UK to bring taupe to them that they could then sell on and I think that was the kind of final part that we, a few guys got together and said we've got to do something about it. Initially it was uh, SOS was the kind of organisation, Save Our Sharks, that then developed into Sasakin. Through really the early days of Sasakin it tried to look at basically fish conservation and regeneration of inshore fish stocks. As a lot of the guys know, have known for years, <laughs> say known for years, we used to have some very, very good fishing in the west coast of Scotland and we saw first hand the, the sort of devastation that had happened to that. That was really where it all started. Uh, leading on from there to get to the, the event side was probably a wee bit down the road after the start of Sasak and that we were trying to promote the tagging of skate, any of the shark species really. So we looked at the first Sasak and tagging event was up here. We were at this weekend at Loch Sunat and we tried that. It was very successful the first year. It then led on, we thought we could do this uh, down the other areas that we fish. So we thought we'd run a tagging event down Loose Bay. To answer your point really about the, the multi-centre, it's the, these areas, there, there's various uh, different ports, different fishing, different places fish different times of year, but we, we wanted to, to get as many people involved, having a, a bit of fun but with a serious side of collecting data because that, that really uh, the data collection is something that we need to pull together for the politicians and the guys that do the political arm of Sasak and went to the government they were they really need data that's what the what they'll respond to and there wasn't any so the tagging has developed and obviously now we've got quite an army of volunteer taggers targeting all the, the different species of shark. So that's the kind of background as I, as I would see it. Yeah, I think the, the one other thing to say, the, the question you asked Phil was, well why does this tagging scheme differ from others? And I would say that the main difference between a Scottish shark tagging scheme and the previous schemes that we've seen or been involved in indeed is that as well as collecting the scientific data, the shark tagging in Scotland has been used as a, I guess, a powerful marketing tool to promote Scottish sharks and the, the concerns we have for them. Um, so, as Willie has said, we've brought in politicians, we've brought out people from tourist boards, and we've brought on board a lot of scientists and people from uh, Scottish Natural Heritage and used the events and the publicity that creates to really just flag up the concerns that we have. Obviously, in the longer term, we will have a very... We, we, we have a, a database of information that's grown on a day-by-day, month-by-month basis, and we'll go on for for years. But in addition, by running an event like this and getting other people involved, out, people maybe outside the angling world, we're just highlighting to a wider audience the sort of issues that are facing the marine environment and sea anglers in particular. And also, I guess, another good thing about the events is it also highlights the actual value of sea angling to uh, local communities, uh, it, often in sort of remote rural areas, where they, they really, in many cases, would derive no benefit at all from uh, a longline vessel coming in and basically taking all the fish away. The problem as I see it though is that using dark tags, which are small plastic tags carrying a number and contact details, relies in the first instance on that fish being caught again, then on the willingness of its captor, which is more than likely going to be a commercial fisherman than an angler, reporting the information back. A cynic might argue that it's perhaps not in the best interest of commercial fishing to help anglers in the fight for species protection zones. How would you then respond to that? That's a very valid point you make. I mean, I'm sure most people can understand that certain commercials, if it's not, if they believe it's not in their interest, they won't record the tags, uh, which is why this is an angler-led project. For sure, uh, we are looking for anglers to record all the data they get 
and from that point of view uh, we believe conclusions will be drawn I think a thing to remember with some of these species is they have now been protected commercially so you could argue that it's really that there should be no real issue with the commercial guys actually reporting what they catch however we're not naive we live in the real world all we can do is ask for people to uh, record them and our records show we've had taupe recorded as far away as the Azores by commercials and also quite a lot of fish now showing up annually in uh, the same areas they'd previously been caught and tagged. This most certainly raises the profile of conservation with both the public generally and anglers specifically who've got the incentive of better fishing in the future to aim at. But what about funding incentives to allow the organisation to work to the optimum? Incentives, I think genuinely all the guys do put a lot of work in voluntarily. Yes there is cost and it would be great if we were in a much better position uh, financially, getting grants or whatever to do uh, more research but there's a lot of uh, effort put in individually by the team at Sasakin and the general membership. But I think it just shows the willingness there is to protect and if possible enhance the marine environment more fish in the sea, uh, more anglers. I think we, we all feel very privileged that we've had fish in the sea to go go catch, but will they be the year, there for years to come for all our kids to go and catch? That's uh, debatable, but we'd like to see certainly regeneration of areas. I think that's just fundamental to other guys. What about the returns from the tags you've already put in? Obviously, this is going to be species dependent, with some more prone to wandering than others. But data on all of them, I take it, is urgently required. So what can you tell us about the evidence and trends now coming through, three years on into the scheme? Well, we have had returns, uh, quite a lot, actually. Um, from your point of view, obviously you saw us catch a spur dog earlier today that had a tag in, which we haven't managed to find the details of yet, but once we get ashore we'll look up but we believe that fish was probably tagged three years ago. From that point of view, we're getting very, very uh, high returns of common skate from the Firth of Lawn and Crinan areas. Uh, we're getting returns in both the sea locks of spur dogs and even with the taupe, which are far more wide-ranging migratory fish, uh, we have had captures of fish in exactly the same areas several years after. From the point of view of meaningful data, well, I, I confess I'm not a scientist, I don't profess to be. Obviously, the beauty of this scheme is that we are linking real anglers with real marine scientists. And from that point of view, it will be interesting to see that the conclusions that they come up with, although we believe many of these will prove things that anecdotal evidence that we've said in the past, which we believe perhaps a lot of the spur dogs in the Scottish sea locks are resident. Certainly the common skates seem to be resident and the fact that so many taupe are tagged and yet don't return, uh, I think questions have to be asked to what's happening to them. Is dark tagging not to a certain extent cosmetic, in that while you clearly are being seen to be doing something, it doesn't generate much percentage-wise in terms of return data? Would it not be better to use fewer costlier alternatives which don't necessarily require recaptures to download data from? Yes, yeah, you're quite right. I mean. Dark tagging is a proven method used worldwide. You're quite right, there are other methods and we do use those, but they are more expensive. Uh, we have a monitoring, or we have run for a year uh, electronic tags in Loch Etive with a monitoring station at the mouth of the loch to see if the fish that were captured in the loch and returned with the data tag on uh, actually swam in and out of the loch. We also have data storage tags which self-release and then float to the surface and then the information in them can be downloaded which gives information as to the different depths that the, the fish has been swimming at. But clearly dart tagging is the sort of easy to do mass not too expensive type of arrangement which is used worldwide so far be it for us to reinvent the wheel when it comes to that. Fill us in a little more on some of the returns. You must have some specific examples which are of interest. Yes, we have. Uh, at the moment we have over 5,000 pieces of data, which is uh, growing on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, obviously, uh, at every one of these events, 
we run, we get more fish tagged. All the anglers that are here go away with tagging kits and carry on tagging. I think from memory, shark attack last year, we had over 200 fish tagged on the weekend. And obviously, returns now, I think the statistics are that we're getting at least, I think, one in five or one in four skate tags are recaptured. And we actually have one skate that holds a record at the moment, which has been up and down to the seabed nine times. Interestingly, it's got a name. It's called Yo-Yo. I take it that the tagathon itself also helps raise funds for the data gathering and handling. But it doesn't take an accountant to work out that what Sasaka might ideally like to do and what it can afford to do, in financial terms, are literally poles apart. What then is being done to bridge that gap? I would say, first of all, on the, the events and income for Sasaka, really the events clear the feet as such. Uh, we'd, we've seen uh, some of the information that we put together, the handbooks, uh, cards, and the tags, all the stuff that we bring together, we've got size charts, fish ID, guides, all of that costs money. So really the events, they, they clear their feet financially. With regards to the other sources and trying to get money in, it's uh, trying through any grant funding. We have some support from the Loch Lomond Sea Life Centre, there's the Argyle Leader Project, the Friesen Galloway uh, Leader Project, SNH, so the, the guys uh, in the Sasakin uh, Committee that, that do that side of it actually do pretty well, but we could certainly do with more funding, and with more funding we could do more of these other types of tags uh, that we were discussing earlier, and finding out more information. But if he had a no-expense-bird scenario, what would be the ideal approach? In the ideal world you talk about, we would see ourselves being a fully professional organisation, something akin to the RSPB, but obviously they're fighting for the rights of anglers and fighting for regeneration of inshore fish stocks. Clearly, to move from where we are to where we would like to be, we've got a long way to go. But we do seem to have a lot of very willing volunteers uh, I guess what we could do with is, uh, as you quite rightly put out, more funding or, or in the, the current world, more members, more membership fees. And when some old uh, anglers grow old and pass away, perhaps a few legacies some t somewhere wouldn't go amiss, which is exactly what the bird watchers did with their birds and their, their organisation is huge now. Uh, given the number of participating anglers in the UK, that is what we should aspire to. Whether we manage to get there or not, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But, but clearly, a professional organisation representing the views of anglers at a professional level. You mentioned the UK, but for the moment at least, it's a purely Scottish organisation, albeit one with spin-off benefits to the whole of the country and beyond. So has Sir Sacken any aspirations to see the organisation widen its geographical remit? Uh, it would be great if the organisation could take in the uh, the whole of the UK. I guess from that point of view, uh, there does not seem to be much going on south of the border along the same sort of lines, which is a bit of a shame. But ultimately, the, the Sasakan was set up by a group of passionate, like-minded individuals. I guess the one thing we would ask is, is anyone reading your feature or people in, in Wales or England that feel likewise should genuinely think about grouping together uh, and trying to, to follow the same sort of uh, mould we've put in place because clearly from what you've seen in Scotland, Phil, it can work, it does work and it can make a difference. If I wasn't already convinced of that, then I wouldn't be here today. For me, it makes one hell of a difference. You need only look to the legislation now in place protecting skate, taupe and several other species for evidence of that. We are fighting for the, the Scottish angle, but the hard work that the teams put in, it's not really to, to take over and run the, the whole of the UK. We would certainly share information with, with any other groups similar interested uh, in conservation of fish stock, regeneration. And I, I know that the guys have been in touch with some other countries. I think they've just sent information and setting up some programmes to Belgium anglers. Dennis, the Sasakin secretary, has been over and doing presentations in Italy, so 
we are reaching a wider audience but it's certainly something that we need more people probably at the sharp end, the organising end and I'm sure English, Welsh, Irish setup could be working in conjunction with these guys. As I hinted earlier, there is a great irony here in that your successes to date have been more beneficial to England and Wales than they have to Scotland. At the end of the day, I don't think fish have ever heard of borders, uh, and many of our fish do, I guess, swim around about the UK, so from where we're sitting, as long as they're still swimming around and they're to be caught, and, uh, and for the enjoyment of anglers, we're not really that too concerned. We, we, we don't wish to keep them all for ourselves. No, I was thinking more in terms of the legislation protecting talk when they swim in English or Welsh waters. So Sacken was behind all that. But until January of next year, the moment those talks come across the Solway into Scotland, that protection is no longer there. Yeah, I mean, the talk legislation was obviously put in place in England and Wales prior to Scotland had agreed to sign up for it. Uh, in some ways, you would argue that we would, should, and we have a much stronger, more powerful commercial fishing lobby in Scotland than uh, perhaps there are in uh, or there is in England and Wales so I would say that makes what we've achieved even more remarkable. Right that's the background to the tagathon concept out of the way. Can we now talk three years on into the project about the individual tagging events themselves starting of course with this one that we're taking part in here which is primarily targeting spur dogs. I think the main reason we chose these two locks was these are two locks that were very have always been popular with anglers and the anglers that fished them witnessed at first hand the devastation that a long line vessel can do in just a couple of weeks. From that point of view, the fishing you're seeing today here, Phil, is just a shadow of what this lock used to produce. And it was the fact that I guess in plain sight of both the local community and the anglers that fish it it was, uh, for want of a better word, raped and pillaged. And from that point of view, we had to make a stand. Uh, Loch Etive, it was a very similar situation. Good spur dog fishing, good thornback ray fishing. And then suddenly, a boat that wasn't even registered or landing really f with anything to do with Scotland, turns up and takes the fish away. No benefit to anyone locally. And it, I guess it was, in many cases, Mark Moan, the, the general anger of, of seeing this happening and nothing being done about it. There's a strong possibility that these are resident populations with little or no benefit from influxes from outside either of the two locks, thereby making the incident mentioned even more devastating than ever. Could be. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, that's one of the, the, the main aims of the of the tagging scheme to, to try and identify such areas and from the point of view of uh, conservation with the Scottish Government if you can prove that it is a resident population they will think about helping you preserve those stocks uh, if it's a migratory population that swims in and out of the loch the general view coming from the fisheries department is that well what point would that be because they're all going to leave anyway so it is an important piece of work we're doing on that uh, and hopefully over the next few years we will be able to draw some meaningful conclusions to it. And it's been a successful piece of work too, I take it, on both locks, as there is now some protection in place. Yes, we have. The Spud Dog, I think a couple of years ago, now got full European protection, which was something that when we first started Sasakin and looking at the, the events, that was our, uh, one of our big goals, so that was great to hear. The protection of individual areas is something that, say, only with data being gathered, uh, scientists uh, looking at that, then on to the politicians, can we ever look to preserve areas? And it, it is a, an ongoing process. It's really it in a nutshell. As far as the events go, it started off, the, the event was only run here in Loch Sunnet, but because we know Loch Etive as well holds a lot of uh, reasonable stock of spur dog, a lot of anglers go there that we decided to put a second venue in. Some of the guys are over there running that this same weekend. That real concept of having a tagging event started here, then we thought why not do it elsewhere? So Stuart and myself, we looked at it, come up with an idea for running one down the southwest of Scotland, mainly pursuing tote. 
The second mass tagging event was shark attack, which again I have attended fishing with yourselves aboard your bigger boat. And again, for various reasons, that too has a split venue theme. Yeah, Shark Attack is a flagship event, it's the main event, Phil. Uh, it's a multi-centre event which we fish on the, the Scottish side of the Solway, uh, Loose Bay area. From that point of view, the main centres are Brickhouse Bay at Kikubri, Isle of Whithorn, Dromore and Sandhead. The reason we operate it as a multi-centre event is we want to understand, one, what the distribution is of, of the different shark species in the whole of the Upper Solway, and it, in practical terms as well, when you've got 250 competitors, perhaps 60 boats, uh, with the limited launching facilities that we have in South West Scotland, you can't really all have them all turning up on the same slipway on the same morning. So from that point of view, also uh, it allows uh, anglers to go and fish where they want to fish, rather than being too regimented. So it's a, it's a come along help, fish when you like, fish where you want, as long as you're in the general area. And we find that for modern sea anglers who, who like to do their own thing often, uh, they find that they can come fish where they want, go where they want, but also then in the evening socialise with, with a lot of like-minded individuals at, at one of the centres. One of the big plus points outside of the data gathering as I see it is that it accommodates everyone from the biggest charter boats offering space to people who can't afford their own trail boats right through to the kayakers. Plus at all of the venues, including to some extent Loose Bay, it can also offer good fishing with a fair degree of shelter thrown in. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the venues we choose are deliberately chosen to offer uh, all weather possibilities for all different types of craft. Obviously the upper end of Loose Bay is ideal for kayak anglers, whereas offshore at Whithorn is better with larger powered boats. So we know for sure that uh, during the shark attack weekend given the nature and indented coastline that we're fishing that we should get out and afloat somewhere in a safe manner and obviously give everybody the chance to participate and everybody the chance to catch and tag a fish and last year for the first time a common skate specific venue was also added in that being crinan though skate tagging in scotland as we've already said has a history going back many years the event at Crinan, or, or West Argyle as we publicise it, really encompasses uh, right from Oban all the way down to Crinan, although uh, we are also trying to develop that to be more of a national project for other areas where you, the anglers fish for skate. The reason we chose to fish it in the Crinan area, actually the base is at Ardfern, which is a few miles north of Crinan, was simply because of the uh, excellent facilities and uh, proximity to the fishing grounds. It's also safe sheltered water for, for small boaters at that time of year. You quite rightly say that Common Skate have been tagged for quite a number of years with the Glasgow scheme and the, the UK scheme. But once again, I guess coming back right to one of the very first questions you asked is the difference between our events and we would say the previous tagging events is ours are as much social gatherings and an opportunity for us to market the sport and what we're doing to the wider sort of environmental scientific bodies and you know if you've been along to, with us and seen these events you'll see we have marine scientists politicians we, we try and get these people afloat tourist board officials just to let them see what they've got and, and what the real sort of draw and power of sea angling could be if it was properly managed and if the seas were were full of fish again all the talk on the scientific side so far has been centred around tag data gathering. But that isn't the only data you've been collecting in and processing. Fish numbers, sexes and sizes, plus anecdotal catch frequency evidence has also been welcomed. So what, if anything, are these data telling you? There's been various bits of research done. There's been a major study done of the uh, economic benefit of Sea Island to Scotland, done by an economist employed by the Scottish Government. That, that's been very helpful. The meetings and relationships that we've built with politicians in various parts of Scotland uh, obviously led to the first ever debate about recreational sea angling in the Scottish Parliament, something which I guess none of us thought we would ever see. And we've been amazed by the level of support that we have received from politicians in coastal communities and I guess the warmth of, of feeling towards us on wanting to take things forward positively. At the end of the day, when we, or, or when officials from Sasakan first went to the government to say, you know, 
will you help protect the fish stocks? Can we help you? I guess the, the thing at that time, there was a lot of unknowns. We were working really hard to, to try and uh, build relationships, build knowledge and understanding of the sport of sea angling to people who are not involved in the sport, in particular organisations like Scottish Natural Heritage, who do great work but have very few field workers, so you can see synergies there, and the likes of local tourist boards who try really hard to get people into Scotland out of season uh, but had very little knowledge of, of the number of sea anglers, for instance, that we have in November here at, in a remote area. And with the fisheries uh, uh, office as well, who have plenty of information on commercial fish stocks but virtually no information on non-commercial fish stocks. So a huge amount of relationship building, a huge amount of information gathering and, as you say, anecdotal evidence of, of other things that, that we, we are aware. But rather than just keeping it in-house, trying to share that with as many people as possible. And to ensure that worrying trends are either nipped in the bud, or better still, as with the common skate, reversed completely, what further work urgently needs to be done? Or to put it another way, at what point might it be appropriate to start patting each other on the back, having achieved what you originally set out to achieve? I think, logically, we all have to live in the real world. There are huge issues facing the marine environment. We are just one of many, many uh, NGO organisations who are trying to bring improvements. Unfortunately, I don't think our work will ever be finished. Things that we still need to do at the moment, the government and SACN and other governmental organisations are working on marine protected areas. We're actively involved in that. A marine strategy for sea angling in Scotland, we're involved in that and obviously work with various scientific bodies to try and understand the sort of population demographics of the various shark species. Sasakin is not just a shark only uh, organisation, we are looking at ways to engage with anglers maybe who fish for cod, obviously a species which has huge issues in European waters. So I think we're going to be busy for a while yet, Phil. I don't think we can quite pack up and go home just yet. And when collecting data, particularly anecdotal data, what sorts of questions are being asked and how much weight might this carry? Firstly, it wasn't us that did this uh, research project. It was the Scottish Government. It was a Scottish Government-funded project which we assisted them with. From that point of view, the general questions used were I guess how often you went sea angling, where you bought your tackle, how much you spent on uh, accommodation, what sort of places you would visit and basically any other information concerning your day's fishing or an angler's day's fishing. The findings were I think very surprising to a number of politicians but to anyone who regularly goes on a busy beach or to one of the busy sea angling destinations probably not such a huge surprise to sea anglers. The fundamental question here has to be, why are these fish in need of so much protection in the first place? And by that, I'm looking beyond the obvious answer that the population numbers are becoming dangerously low. The question should be, how low? And why hasn't something been done about this problem sooner? Is it all down to commercial greed? I think lately there's been some TV programmes have even highlighted the perils of all the, the shark species, the finning that goes on throughout the world, for a lot of it's sold to the, the Japanese for the shark fin soup, but uh, there's been some uh, horrendous killing of sharks just for their fins, but locally uh, what we found here there was uh, long lining boats targeting all the way up through the Irish Sea, up through the sea lochs in the west coast here and going further up towards the north of Scotland, uh, setting long lines, five, six, seven thousand hooks all baited, coming into a sea loch like this, it doesn't take too long to clear out all the mature fish, really the breeding stock. Uh, as it happens, spud dog they are they have the longest gestation period of any fish, it's just about two years. It takes them about 10 to 15 years to get to sexual maturity and very, very slow growing. There have been research done previously. Some of the spur dog can grow 70, 80 years quite easily. So it takes them a long while to establish uh, populations that can be wiped out, I can't say instantly, but very, very quickly. 
we touched earlier on the, the fact these sea logs, we believe, are sort of resident populations. But in years gone by, there used to be a very big migratory run of spur dogs up through the Irish Sea, as I said, and in fact, indeed, all round Britain. The spur dog population, they reckon, is at 5% of its biomass, and that's in the, the past 20, 25 years that that decline has happened, which is almost criminal. And really, these local populations, we do need to, to try and understand and protect them. But not just the spur dog or other species. You know, as, as you said, spur dog now have the protection in European waters, but they're only part of the, the big ecosystem. And uh, that's the sacking. Uh, see, it's not just sharks that we're, we're trying to protect. On top of which, sharks don't exactly help themselves. Producing small numbers of well-developed offspring as they do works fine when everything is in ecological balance. But as a recovery strategy from the kind of man-made disaster we're talking about here, it can take many years, if indeed it works at all. No, it certainly doesn't help, but that's probably been the evolution. The shark species were invariably towards the top end of the, the food chain. They didn't need to produce huge numbers of, of young, unlike the cod and other species. I'm not a scientist, but evolution has has made these shark species they can be slow growing they are the top of the food chain they don't have predators other than us humans which is uh, with a long line of efforts uh, and the finning that goes on around the world it's very very easy to decimate uh, stocks and that's what's happening throughout the world now you've mentioned the commendable role played by anglers in collecting these data but what about the other side of the coin the earlier role also played by anglers in exacerbating the situation because let's be honest here over the years we haven't exactly been blameless in all of this i completely disagree with there phil as someone who, who's obviously been involved with the commercial fishing fleets the amount of fish taken out of the sea by anglers is absolutely minuscule compared to the fishing fleets so at the end of the day i I have no concern that anything anglers have done has had any real impact on the fish stocks. Well, I think we'll have to agree to disagree on that one, I'm afraid. Being the age I am, I well remember talk competitions based on overall weight generating piles of discarded rotting carcasses. Also, of deliberately overcropping spur dogs with hundreds of aborted yolk sack put strewn all over the deck. I agree, it doesn't happen now, thankfully, but what I am saying is that we as anglers also have skeletons in our cupboards too. Yeah, for sure, in the past, those sort of things did happen. But I think even now, I mean, it would be, I would suggest to you, 10 to 15 years at least since the last time that that sort of event had been fished. It's a fact, on a daily basis, over 2 million pounds weight of fish are landed on a daily basis at Peterhead Fish Market. That's a lot of fish. So what, in your opinion, can be done collectively on the part of Sasakan, anglers and government to help those species now teetering on the brink? Yeah, well, I mean, most of the shark species now are the subject of worldwide concern. As far as Sasakan is concerned, all we can do is to flag up what the particular issues are in Scotland. Uh, and hopefully by doing that, that means that when ministers or officials representing Scotland are at European fisheries meetings when it comes to conservation in, in relation to shark species they put their hand up and support them similarly we would hope people in wales or people in england if we can get organized would ensure that their officials do the same the drive for protection of the spur dog which is something that we've supported wholeheartedly and obviously what we're doing here today is related to was actually primarily driven or progress through Europe by the Germans. So from that point of view, this is not a, a Scotland only problem with shark species, it is worldwide. As Willie has said, there's been some quite shocking TV programs by celebrity chefs on the TV recently, which has been very, very positive from the point of highlighting the issues up to uh, the general public. But no, I mean, still lots to do. As the two main event organizers, what more are you planning to do in the future to take this aspect of the fight even further forward? I would think we're probably looking at getting bigger participation in the events. We have the, the series of the three events now, 
I don't know at this moment that we'd look to increase that. We'd probably look to diversify into maybe some of the other species, uh, raising awareness, but getting more people out fishing, be it existing anglers or people new to the sport, uh, youngsters, just general people out fishing and enjoying the wonderful environment around Scotland. And I think it's, it is important that the local communities uh, benefit greatly from sea angling. And this weekend here alone, the locals, uh, we've been coming up here a number of years now and it's it's like a family kind of thing in the, the hotel. We're most welcome. They've put up a trophy for the guys as well. It's all to do with building that sort of friendship. And Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Willie. I think we've got a really good product with the uh, the actual events that we've we've got now. And I think for the next few years, certainly, the main focus will be on increasing participation levels, increasing the promotion uh, of the events. But certainly, we, we don't plan to run more than three tagging events at the moment. Uh, going forward, obviously, the focus also has to be on other fish species because the inshore waters are filled with other fish other than sharks. But, but certainly, increasing participation and promotion of the event is probably what we'll actually concentrate on rather than the actual product which we believe is now good and known by lots of people. And until you've actually been up to one of these events and sampled it, forgetting the serious side for the moment, as important as that is, it has an almost fishing club air about it. Everyone it seems knows each other and wants to be friendly to newcomers. Then there's the evenings in the pub socialising and talking fishing. And let's not forget all the wind ups and mickey taking too. It's a really good fun event. So if for no other reason than that, it's most definitely well worth trailing up from England for. The slogan we quite often like is fun, friendly fishing. At the end of the day, a lot of guys just go fishing to relax. From our point of view, come to one of our events and you can go out with like-minded individuals, have a good day's fishing, have a couple of beers and a, and a chat in the pub and go home knowing that you've done something decent that might actually in some small way help the future of your sport uh, and we've been amazed quite frankly by the number of people that are willing to sign up to that concept I mean you've seen the shark attack event in, in the summer there are no prizes at that event it is not a competition uh, we just ask people to come and help us and now it is the largest boat angling event in Scotland just because people want to do the right thing and the beauty of this is you can come and do the right thing and have a laugh at the same time and as with today Get out in winds gusting well in excess of 30 knots with fish to £134 taken within the last hour. Incredibly, by Gordon Goldie, anchored just to the side of us, who caught and tagged the same common skate in exactly the same spot on a previous tagathon. What are the chances of that? If I was him, I would most definitely be looking to buy a lottery ticket when I get in. That's right, yeah. It's common skate today and yesterday. And I mean, you've seen we've we've had some nice bird dogs today. And also we've caught one that's previously been tagged, which we'll be interested to find out all about. And for the future, how do you see this whole scenario panning out? My personal view is going forward is that nature conservation and natural resources around the UK, i.e. the fish stocks, are going to become increasingly important. The world we live in today is clearly very different from the one we were in 20 or 30 years ago. And the end game for us is to ensure that however things go forward, that sea anglers have a real voice during these decision-making processes. Oh, I would uh, agree with Stuart's comments there. I think it is uh, one of the other Sasakin projects that we run is Fish for the Future. That sums it up, Fish for the Future. We do Give Fish a Chance initiative. We do educational outreach around the schools uh, with two project officers work with us at the moment so there's a lot of other things that SASAC can do do and I think it's that education out there to existing anglers to other anglers and just the general public letting them know the worries that we have about the sport longer term I hope that all the, the hard work gets some protection put in place which would allow regeneration of our stocks I'm not naive enough to, to think that they'll be back to what they were many years ago, but I'm sure things could be done. And gathering the research, gathering all the anglers and public together in a single voice, it's got to help. What could I possibly add to all of that? 
I just wish that you would both help try to spread the word south of the border, because English and Welsh anglers are doing very little at the organised level, which the Scots have shown very clearly works. My thanks then to Willie and Stuart, not only for talking the subject through with frequent edited out stoppages to boat and tag fish, but also for the day afloat fishing with them. A day I really think wasn't going to happen when I heard the wind howling around the corner of the guest house in the middle of the night. But that's the beauty of Loch Summer at an etif for you. It might be a long way up, but you are at least all but guaranteed of getting the floor, and on summit, be in with a very good chance of fish well in excess of a hundred pounds. Thank you.